So thanks. This is our final session. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for coming in this afternoon. We wanted to finish today with a um, to hear from a panel of experts on their views of where we're heading as an industry and where we could get better, um, things we could stop doing or start doing. So we've got our panel from uh, my right at the far end: Rob Rutherford from Red Metals, mm -hmm. Rick Valenta from the Bryan Research Centre. Paul Hodgson from NERA, the National Energy Resources Australia Industry Growth Centre, and Helen de Gelling, uh, Minerals Geoscience Director at GSQ, week three. Very happy to have um, <laughs> Helen on board after. So the, the panel session this afternoon, um, I did wind up Rob a bit about getting him wound up. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess, hear back from our panel members their thoughts on a very broad topic, give them room to move. And the question we wanted to, um, I guess, canvas this afternoon was, in terms of future discovery, how do we keep a commercial advantage while fostering greater collaboration and information sharing? I'll read that again. In terms of future discovery, how do we keep our commercial advantage while fostering greater collaboration and information sharing. Well, there it is on the screen, for those of you who can see it. Does anybody want to have a crack at that one first? We'll think about it for a minute. And I'll, I'll, I'll be provocative. This is, this, is what, this is how I got Rob going before. Let's start with data confidentiality. Now, in the uh, petroleum sector, uh, Petroleum Gas Act tenure holders, there are data confidentiality periods. Um, Justin, you need to help me with the five and two. Is Justin here? Five and two, two and two. Um, anyway, there are specific terms of when data is confidential when you report it to us if you're a Petroleum and Gas Act tenure holder. Under the Mineral Resources Act, there isn't. What that means is that data is held confidential for life of tenure. That means expiration tenure, and if expiration tenure is progressed to production tenure, a mining lease, the data is confidential. So you can have data confidential for 40 years. And I guess maybe as a starting question, where do we think that's, where does that play out? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Should we change it? Helen, why don't you just kick us off? Well, with my two and a half weeks of experience in government, um, I actually have more of an industry perspective on this, I suppose. I've worked in a number of junior, um, junior gold and base metals companies um, throughout Australia, and, but including also uh, the Mount Isa area. And... I, I don't really, to be honest, see the point of keeping data secret for decades and decades, certainly, and even for years and years. Um, a lot of the most pertinent data for most, the majority of companies, not all companies, but for the majority of companies, becomes public because they want their shareholders to know of the success that they're having. So they will publish their drilling results, for example, to the ASX within, within weeks of drilling. So that kind of vetoes the idea of confidentiality, I think, in, but those larger data sets contain a lot of other useful information which don't necessarily um, equate to gold, copper, base metals or other direct commodity um, assays, but all of the geochemical data that we can use for footprints um, for more broad research, that becomes confidential, but it has much, much larger research implications that we could all use uh, on a regional scale. So I suppose I'd like to throw this to my right and get some more thoughts on that sort of thing. Okay. Um, look, oh, okay, my, my microphone's on. Um, I, so I'm from NERA, which is an industry growth centre for the energy resources sector. Um, there's six industry growth centres, so I'll just give you a 
bit of a quick snapshot of that. And they, because they're really driven by areas of strategic competitive advantage for the Australian economy and energy resources. And there's also one in mining equipment, technology and services as well, uh, covering the resources space. And the key thing is, is there's a lot of local competition in Australia. So we're very good at hand holding on to 100% of nothing rather than actually sharing it. And I think this, this gets to this point, I think, of, of data as well. Um, it's really about understanding what is the value of that data. Um, and often it's not as much as we would like to think it is on its own. Um, it requires a whole bunch of other things attached to it, other expertise from inside and outside the company, from government, uh, from research, uh, from technology providers, and um, from the community potentially, that's actually going to unlock the value in that data. Um, so I think um, often it's really about understanding and trying to get over this kind of, if, you know, if I think about how the mining industry started, you know, it really was a kind of people go out and, and really having that data and, and having the pick or having them panning for gold or something and actually finding it, the discovery was actually the, the actual key thing and I think we've become a lot more sophisticated and we'll become a lot more sophisticated in the future if you hear the sort of artificial intelligence and, and the data sharing and data modernisation type things. Um, it takes a lot more to make a deposit commercial uh, than simply some of that data. So I think it's, it's really just understanding that, I think, a bit more and being a bit more sophisticated, understanding that my little bit of value, um, if I share it, I might get a greater value and greater commerciality. Yeah, I mean, I think I pretty much, I pretty much agree with that. There's a, there's a whole range of different situations around data that, um, you know, if, if data is timely, if you've paid for a data set, you know, if you've gone out and paid millions of dollars for a data set and you're the only person that has it and therefore have an opportunity to act on it, then, then it makes sense that you should have some, that, that you should have time to do that. Um, if, you've, if you've owned a piece of land for, for 15 years and, and you don't want to give up the data and drop the ground because of the schmuck factor, you know, the idea that somebody else is going to come in and take your, take, find something on your ground and you just want to sit on it. Well, that's not good. And it's just holding everybody back from, from, uh, from, um, you know, from potentially, um, you know, making a discovery on that ground. And then I think that's a very different situation. But I think also that in general, people do place a lot more value on their data than, than is actually there um, because there's, it has no value if you're not going to going to act on it and and um, and and you know there's a I think there is a, an unstated time limit so um, you know I, I think I, I certainly agree with the idea that there should be there should be a time at which almost every piece of data that gets collected by a company becomes public you know it's not immediately but it should it should definitely it should definitely happen and I mean I think that what we're finding in, in, in the Northwest Mineral Province, part of the work that we're doing there, is that people are parting with their data in, in different ways and in ways that allow them to hold on to some aspects of it that may be confidential while, while at the same time um, being able to, to you know, gain, gain benefit from sharing, sharing with other people um, you know, so, or sharing with other, with other groups in a, in a particular area to produce a new data set. So. Often as well, it's the, it's the interpretation and the ideas that you've got around your data that might be yeah. precious or confidential rather than the data itself, yeah. I think. Um, well, my experience with data sharing is, 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 is um, limited, but um, I'm, I'm all for the idea of sharing data. But there is a you got a little bit, have a little bit of respect for the people that you're taking the data off. And my experience was, in South Australia, they brought this law in where you have five years and then you can request the, these data, which is all very good. And then they're supposed to tell you that somebody's requested your data. But I found out when I saw all my data on a presentation in the ASX and saying, that's our gravity data, how did that get up there? And so they just gave all our data out, which we were still had that tenement. So that tenement is still current, we're still doing work on it but we're seeing all our data in the public. And then where it becomes a bit of a curly issue is we're now we're competing, we're, we wanted to went to a competitive tender on a, on a data, a block next door to us, and we had all this com supposed competitive advantage with this data because our own data, now all our competitors have got it and they're using that to justify why they're going to bid on the ground next door. So 
we were at a slight disadvantage on that, but um, uh, so yeah, there's, a, there's pros and cons, I'm, and uh, I think, but personally I'm, I'm, I have no problems with putting data out there if people who, if, particularly if a tenement's still current, then I think you sh should be something put in place that says, well, if someone wants to come and use it, they've got to share that data with the guy who's still got the tenement current, and not just use that. As a, as a strategic advantage against that people, against them with the tenement. So that might soften the blow a little bit. Yeah, no, I think they're, they're all valid points. And, uh, you know, if I think back to the conversation this morning, the discovery drought we're seeing in the Northwest, and when we talk about discovery drought, we're talking about tier one deposits, particularly. I mean, we are finding stuff, I mean, you guys are finding stuff, particularly um, in the Northwest. But it says, you know, the Mount Isa scale deposits that we're particularly keen to see one or more of those discovered sooner rather than later. Um, but tell me about, I, I hear the issue of, of sharing of, of data and confidentiality periods and I, I think I'm hearing that generally there's a, an agreement that we should, uh, maybe the, the way we do it and the term perhaps is the issue to, to consider. What about this collaboration, we hear a lot about it uh, these days. What, what does it mean to you, collaboration, and is it a good thing, is it a buzzword that we can ignore and all go away? Um, tell me about collaboration. That's a pretty broad question. Well, within the, the GSQ, in my new role as the Minerals Director, I am learning all about the fantastic projects that the guys are working on under the New Discoveries Project program and every single one of those or almost every single one of those relies heavily on collaboration from other organizations and from industry the the projects are designed very much for the greater good for the the uh, furtherance of uh, exploration and mineral prospectivity in the northwest minerals province um, but collaboration is essential to those projects. We need data from industry. How that works, um, I guess, is negotiable. Um, however, the, the reference collection, for example, which, from what I understand of the surveys that were done last year, that's one of the key products that industry would like to see uh, from this uh, round of projects, from the New Discoveries Program, where our team is creating a, basically a baseline set of data for mineral deposit types in the Mount Isa region. So data from each of the key deposits throughout the area, um, distal and proximal, so you can look at alteration halos, uh, geochemical footprints, all of that sort of stuff, but we can't do it without input from industry. Um, and you'd be surprised by the amount of data that the GSQ doesn't have um, from those huge stores of data that have been collected by industry over the last 70 or 80 years. So in order to support the industry, we need the industry's help in that regard, which requires strong collaboration, which we're doing our best to foster. But, and I think it goes, it goes both ways. The, most of the, our industry partners are very, very keen to see that happen. Um, yeah, look, Tony, I'd probably agree that collaboration can sometimes be a, a buzzword, and it, and it really needs to be understood properly before people get into it, I think. It's, uh, it's not doing everything together, it's not putting commerciality aside, um, and, but what I think it's really about is, is looking at the longer term and actually the bigger picture and really understanding how you can develop a relationship where you're doing things uh, together that will actually increase the size of the pie and you'll each get uh, a better slice of it. Um, as I said, with the industry growth centres, we're, we're about driving collaboration in Australia. Australia is a, an energy superpower in the world. We, uh, we export more than two thirds of our energy resources, uh, mainly uh, coal, well, coal, oil and gas and uranium. Um, but uh, we, we think that in a competitive world and with competitive alternative energy sources as well, um, we actually need to accelerate the development, the discovery, uh, the development of, of what we do. We need to be clever at what we do um, and we need to build a quality, a global quality and scale to what we do. So we need to 
uh, make sure that uh, larger companies are, are, are have visibility of, of technologies that are coming through that may be able to assist them and can provide a, a, a competitive edge. Um, we, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, bring the industry together so that they can they can attract talent. These are things that are difficult to do one by one. So collaboration really does, does need to have a, a really clear outcome in mind. Um, it's not a common vision. Um, that's probably what I would have said 10 years ago. What I think it is is finding those points of intersecting self-interest. Um, so where actually everyone is going to be pulling in the same direction on particular things, and it's not everything. Um, in any type of collaboration, you'll have areas that you actually agree that you are maybe even fierce competitors on, but there'll be points that actually just make sense for you to work together, and it's not all or nothing, um, but it does require a, long, a longer term picture than, than a, a simple transaction. Uh, you won't get anything out of a collaboration on day one. There's a, a couple of, I guess a couple of things about collaboration. I already mentioned briefly last last one, so I won't repeat it, all of it. But uh, you know, we were, we just finished a project, or a, a, a sort of component of a project that Mark Hinman was working on around Cannington, where we got drill data from four different companies and used that drill data, you know, in a way that any one of those companies couldn't have done because they were each keeping their proprietary data to produce a solid geology interpretation that couldn't have been produced unless they'd put all that, all that data in. So, I mean, that's an example where collaboration makes sense and nobody's giving away their data. Nobody's giving away their drill data, they're just, but they're getting a product in return that, that is kind of enhanced. But the other, the other example of collaboration, if you sort of switch gears and look at some examples of where, what, where this sort of thing's going on elsewhere is that it's been interesting to me to watch my, you know, in my original home country, Canada, um, in the mining industry has had some real successes in the collaboration space, not through universities collaborating, but through companies getting together and, and, and squeezing money out of the government. So, you know, two examples of that, there's a thing, a project called the CMIC Footprints Project that got the largest um, NSERC grant, which is, I guess, their equivalent of our ARC grant, the largest grant in earth sciences in, in history for studying three deposits, 24 different universities studying three deposits, basically from every possible angle to, to, to define their, their footprint. And it wasn't, the, it wasn't universities that did it, it was basically companies getting together and saying, you've got to fund this. And then they followed that up with, with, um, with a thing called the Metal Earth that's at Laurentian University, where they did the same thing. They got I don't know what it was like 50 million bucks or something out of the out of the um, out of the federal government to to do uh, you know to to do a big global study of a region like the like Northwest Queensland. So so in that case, you know, it's an, I guess it's just another example of a group of companies getting together and actually getting an outcome that may prove beneficial to them down the track. But I certainly agree that. Um, I seem to spend a lot of my time now getting various different people to collaborate on various different projects and and you know the 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 dynamics of how to actually get it going and and not have it turn into something that's that just becomes an exercise where everybody says oh look at me I'm collaborating too aren't I clever um, yeah is is an important thing to try to avoid um, I think collaboration is something you do when you don't have much money and everybody's been, and staff, so everyone's decimated. You guys are decimated in terms of your staffing. Academic societies are as well. Juniors, we live off decimation. And the majors disappeared for 15 years, and they don't like to collaborate. Now, when they get more money, they actually don't want to collaborate. They want it all, hold it all to themselves. So I think as the boom time comes back, you're going to find collaboration very difficult with majors because that's not, and you can see it with Rio Tinto with this discovery in the Patterson. They don't, they've got something they think is valuable, they're not going to share it. They're not very good at that. So I think collaboration works great when things are lean and everyone wants to hug each other. But um, when the boom starts, everyone will go off into their own little shells and, and say, no, we want this proprietary, da 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 da. So you got to pick your projects. I think some of the bigger picture projects are well collaborated and industry, a lot of the majors will support a lot of those sort of things. 
um, probably individual deposit projects, you've got to be a bit sensitive to the guys that have got the deposit because they're giving up a lot more than people who are just coming in with a bit of cash. Mm. So yeah, it can be done, but do it, do it uh, at the right time and uh, you've got to pick your, you know, some, some of the parties aren't always going to be there. That's very refreshing, project. Rob. I think, you're, I think you're right. I mean, difficult times drive that sort of behaviour and you have to collaborate. You, you're sort of drawn together. So I think it's a really valid point. And that's what we've seen lately. I guess that, that, that's our pitch, I suppose, in the North West with these tier one deposits is that it's been a long time without finding one. So it's time to come together to try and find the next deposit. So I guess our undercurrent of messaging is that Collaboration in the northwest for, for your copper, you know, lead and zinc deposits particularly is is warranted. And I think you're right. As soon as someone finds one, the walls will go up. But mm. I'm happy that someone finds one. I'm going to ask you. Um, uh, talk, sorry, change gear. Talk about people and skills. Um, how do you think we're tracking as an industry, as a resource sector? I'm training our, our young people, our older people, across the entire workforce. Uh, do we have the right skills? Do we have the right opportunities to develop skills? The right fora, the right places, the right courses? You know, are we, how, do, how are we looking? What are your views? Tough one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, there's, I think within both both industry and um, and government, there's a lot of um, traditional traditional activity, traditional science, um, and and that that traditional science forms the basis of then launching onto a new platform. So without having a strong base in what you do know, it's then harder to leap into the unknown. I'll say it that way, I guess. Um, we've seen today a lot of talks on artificial intelligence, new approaches to uh, thinking outside of the box, that sort of thing, which is where we need to go as an industry and in science, as a discipline. Um, and in order to know which direction to take, I think then it comes back to the concept of collaboration and talking and finding out um, where are the holes and, and, we, and how should we fill them and, you know, uh, these, these kinds of discussions where we're all sitting here, there's four of us up here talking to you, but, um, you know, in those interactive discussions where, where ideas are flowing and come out and therefore we can then take those ideas and run with them and, and figure out, okay, now we're going to run, say, tomorrow a technical workshop for, aimed at transferring our, our knowledge to industry. Um, that's something new for us and, and looking at new work that we've done and new research that we've done. Um, or, you know, in, inviting speakers to talk about new technology and, and new frontier, basically, techniques for exploration in the industry and, and whether people agree with those techniques or not, whether they, they think the science behind them is valid or not, they're talking about it, and that's the main thing. Um, I, look, I think we can, always, we can always do it better, and I think there, is, um, there are some challenges for this sector in attracting talent. Um, I think Sue Key from uh, the, CR, uh, the ARC Centre for Robotic Vision talked about that quite, uh, quite well this, this morning, actually, about um, part of it, I think, is, is getting uh, particularly career, uh, people looking at which career they're going to go into to see this as a tech sector, which it is. It's very much a tech sector, um, but it's not necessarily seen that way. Um, I think also, um, and this goes to the heart of collaboration, is that really, where's, is the industry really looking at how it's growing and nurturing a pool of talent and that's difficult in a sector that is cyclic. And it does go through areas of, um, you know, there's money, we're awash with money, the prices are high, um, and, you know, we can do all this ourselves, and we're all, we'll pay big dollar for talent, and then the price drops, 
and we just throw them on the scrap heap and then we hope they'll come back a few years later when the next boom comes. Um, and so it's kind of how do, we, how do we manage that, I think, better? So how do we promote the sector? But actually, how do we take, um, uh, whether it's a sharing role or whether it's looking at uh, how we can outplace people when things, things are tough, that they can, we can get, easily get them back? So maybe across sectors, we're actually sharing staff with other uh, uh, counter-cyclical industries or, or the like. Just taking, I think, a little bit more of a talent pool approach. If we do it business by business, we're going to end up with not, no, no, no talent in the pool. Um, and I think it's, that's one of the key things I think we can do better from a collaboration perspective. It's to really just understand about that. Um, we put out an oil and gas uh, future workforce report at the end of July last year. Uh, sorry, this year. It's been a long year. Um, and uh, that we looked at 2030, and we actually looked at that, because a key part of that is also how are we talking to our workforces and, our, and talent about the changes that are coming and how they can upskill and how they can be part of that, uh, not necessarily be fearful of what might be happening. And I think it's just a, a lack of discussion, I think, early on to allow people to move with, with any sort of workplace transitions that are coming. I think... Um one, one, one thing that sort of demonstrated to me that, that um, you know, that things had changed as my career has gone on is that I remember when I was first involved in an exploration company and we had a plotter and we had big layout tables and, and we were, the plotter was just going 24, not 24 seven, the plotter was going all the time, people were laying things out on the table. So when I moved back to Australia and, I, and, and after, after, you know, five years back in Canada and, and uh, opened a new office for a company, and I thought, well, we better get a plotter. And so we bought a plotter and put it in the corner, and nobody ever plotted anything. <laughs> it was all done on the computer. <laughs> or, you know, it was hard. we had a couple of plots that sat in, sat in desks somewhere, but it really, there wasn't as much, there was hardly any plotting that went on anymore. Um, and so there, they, but I think it is true that as a group, we've moved much more towards a data analysis um, type of approach and much less towards a basic geology approach. And I, I'm not sure if, it, if that's good or bad. I think there are aspects of it that are bad, but it, there are also aspects of it, of it that are just reality. You know, if you're exploring for, you know, under, under uh, you know, 500 meters of cover, well, you know, you really have to deal with data analysis. You're not going to be, you know, there's no rocks to look at. Um, but, uh, you know, I, th I think it is uh, so, so, it, but it's the sort of thing I think where where things are evolving, and we probably don't even you know we pro probably don't even realize it until we until we sit back. But you know I've I've listened to a few talks, and this isn't so much about exploration, but about mining, where people have expressed the 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 fear that that if we don't actually change, then it's not going to be mining companies that are mining anymore. It's going to be somebody else, just like Kodak isn't. You know, Kodak isn't making film anymore, and uh, and Nokia's. You know, I think somebody bought the name Nokia, and they're still making Nokia phones. But the Nokia, Nokia as a company isn't doing it. So that we'll, if we don't change, then somebody else is going to come in. You know, somebody, is it Warwick's going to come in and find all the deposits, um, in, in, instead of the you know the the traditional kind of. No, this is what we do. We go and, and you know lay out the maps on the table and we draw a circle and blah blah blah. You know that somebody somebody is going to come in with a completely different approach and you know kind of eat our lunch, which is good, I suppose. It's going to be good for their shareholders. Um, so, but I think that the you know the data analysis thing is is a, is a very or or dealing with dealing with all the data that's available is 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 going to be a reality going forward for, for anybody working in, in the exploration game. So, I've lost track of the question. What was the question? It's around... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I, <laughs> I don't know. Every, it's sort of like whistling skills. secrets. By the time it gets to me, I go, what was the question? <laughs> it's around um, our skills. Have we got the right skills in our workforce, in our people? Have we also got the right opportunities to develop new skills. We just heard about data analytic skills, for example. Sure. Where do you go to get those, for example? Can you go anywhere to get those? Oh, look, I think kids go through kindergarten and they're coding now, so it's a whole different language to what we're used to, so I don't expect, I think the next 
round of young geologists that come through will be a whole different skill level in terms of that sort of stuff than mm. I'm than I'm familiar with. I mean, I I think fundamentally, if the kid, if the guys are going through uni and they understand mineralogy and chemistry, it's, you can't really do geology much it's without that. Great, and then if you want to back that up with some other fancy uh, software and everything else, that's fantastic. Um, and structural geology, whatever you want. Um, at the end of the day, you've got to push those sort of kids through the system, and if they still come out wide-eyed and enthusiastic, then give them a job. It's, but you know, I think, I think the universities are doing, doing that. I, I hope. I don't, I'm not too in contact with it that much. Mm. But all the young guys that I met around, uh, that I met, and in the, in the workforce. We've had enough busts that we've got rid of a lot of the not so guys that aren't that passionate about it. The ones that are still surviving are really passionate and you can see it in their eyes and there. Mm. So they're the guys you want. Um, now you, I think you can attract some very good people that aren't pure field type geologists by, my, and, and I really agree with what they were saying before about the, um, this industry is Australia's Google, the mining industry. It's our Google. We don't have we don't have a manufacturing base, we don't have anything else. So the METs and the, and, the, and the mining industry is where we do all our innovation in Australia. So you really should emphasise that, I think, when you're trying to get kids in and, and get away from the, the nasty mining image. Mm. But... Um, I, know this, I know this is out of sequence, I, 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 but I just wanted to say on, on that front that, you know, after, after being away from a university setting for a very, very long time, and now having been back in one for only a couple of years, it's been really amazing to me to see that, you know, people who two years ago were kind of struggling are now kind of, they, they've learned in that two years, they've learned about a hundred times as much as I've learned in that two years. And so it's really, you know, people are still doing that. They're gonna do that forever. Um, and I, I, you know, I agree completely with what you're saying. That we're still going to produce, you know, what, the people that we produce are going to evolve to, to kind of meet the problem. Yeah, it's interesting because um, Paul and I probably got a vested interest in this in that we both sit on a, what's called the East Coast Leadership Team for the Professional Petroleum Data Management Organisation. It's a not-for-profit. And a large part of that is simply providing a, a forum for people to come together and talk and hear and exchange ideas around data and technology in the petroleum space really it doesn't matter, I mean, because petroleum data is just data. It's the techniques around how you use data that is the topic of conversation. But we're, we're, we're trying to grow that um, initiative beyond people saying it's just for petroleum, because I think it's an important play, thing that we have in Brisbane and in Queensland, and it's a gap at the moment, is where, where do you go, not as a graduate, because the uni's a are teaching people those skills, I don't doubt. But when you're a person with a few years' experience, like some of us in the room, where do we go to get up to speed with some of these techniques and technologies as well? And it's actually not that easy. Um, there aren't regular fora that are run uh, in Brisbane, for example, to do that. There are many societies that do good, good stuff, um, but generally not focused on data technology particularly. I think that, that's a gap that we, certainly we've, I guess, identified and we're trying to, to help um, fill, at least in part. But I wanted to also not make this a one-way discussion. Are there any questions to, to our panel members? Comments? Industrial base here. Uh, one thing about Norbody, you can't move it to China. They can come in and buy it. Yeah, I, I think that's obviously a very true comment. Um, I, I think can that... I, can I just, sorry, can I just, just go on again? You're talking about um, information sharing, and one was the, the coal industry um, has had a long history of, of information sharing, um, as partly, of course, partly because of the nature of coal deposits, but it's also partly because of the government geology departments have, all, have always done a lot of... had always done a lot of drilling ahead to show up the resources. And the other thing... That, that, um, that happens, especially since about the 1960s, has been the control of coal areas and petroleum areas by the government, and they're all leased out by tender. Um, and that's another thing that controls the information sharing and collaboration. 
I just wondered if you thought there was a role for the Queensland Government to get involved going a little bit further with some particular projects, and I'm thinking perhaps ones of strategic interest like heavy rare earths or something like that, to showcase some of the skill set that's built in the department, because it strikes me that the department themselves really understand well how to drive many of the tools that are being developed, and that would um, be like a showcase of what can be done that might be a way of then letting the balance of industry pick up those tools and run with them. I'm interested in your thoughts there. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, and it's actually got some currency at the moment. Um, if I think of rare earths and let's call them technology minerals more broadly, um, that definitely has the attention of this government. Absolutely 100% has the attention of this current government. And, and, and rightly so, because it's an area of emerging uh, demand growth. Uh, and we've just commissioned um, a piece of work to re-sample um, samples, we re reanalyze samples from a, a cross-section of mines and deposits in the northwest, looking for rare earths and cobalt. It was like a reconnaissance uh, trial to see what's there, because in many cases, people haven't analyzed those in the past. If you're chasing gold and so on, you're not necessarily looking for uh, rare earths. So we've actually found quite high results come through from those, um, those re analyses. But the question then becomes, because generally they're, they're not big enough in, the, in and of themselves to warrant uh, separate development. So you then have to look at how do you aggregate enough volume together to form a decent supply, so, uh, supply then the question becomes, how far do we take it in terms of value add? Is it just ore that we, we gather? Is it concentrate? Is it a refined product? And, and what, what are the markets? Because you're seeing now um, companies like SK Innovation, the Korean company, have signed an offtake agreement with Australian mines to take nickel and cobalt directly from the Sconey deposit near Townsville. That's an interesting development where a customer is partnering with a producer. It's not un un unheralded, um, unprecedented, but we're seeing more of that. There's another one on the, on the go now. I won't say the companies because it's sensitive, but same concept as well. So the, the government is thinking through where should it play? Where is the right role for government? And we, there's actually a study going on now to consider yeah, where in that supply demand spectrum should government uh, act to kickstart a new industry. Tony, um, collaboration, I want to come back to that word because um, looking um, for an offshore investor coming in, collaboration in Australia would seem to be a really fraught subject, talking about different rules and different jurisdictions. I know we're talking about Queensland here, but um, collaboration goes much wider I suggest when you're attracting investment in, and you need to attract investment in, um, and that doesn't seem to be understood at the highest levels, that there needs to be um, cohesion. For example, um, having to store product on the Queensland border and then travel with the product on a daily basis into South Australia is just a nonsense, shouldn't happen. Um, I think collaboration isn't occurring down into the grassroots community. So when you're doing a seismic program or an exploration program, that collaboration has been within the industry only. It's not sold well down, and so you get the them and us, and I think that um, we need to recognise that. But my biggest issue, and I put this to the panel, is, is that the industry that we are trying to foster and incubate in this country needs to have a playpen that isn't the big industries that are actually holding the license. They are atrocious and they actually have staff that are mandated to stop doing, to stop that collaboration. Um, it's, it's incredible, I use the term race to be second, and I think that it is the uh, government's position to put a playpen together where companies can take their technology 
and trial it and prove it to the big companies and then it can be showcased just as my colleague has talked about with the rare mineral. So I put it to you that sitting here, academia will not solve this issue. We need to have a playpen. Once the ingredients are correct, the investment will come out, the products will be made, and then they need somewhere to be showcased in real industry conditions. And at the moment, we don't have it. Um, do you want to respond, anyone? Look, I was just going to say, we, we've, uh, we've funded about 44 collaborative projects, about 100 partners. One of the things that we've done is uh, funded a, uh, uh, an LNG plant which is available, which is a commercial, it's a, a, a small scale um, in WA that's going to be developed um, with industry, uh, but will allow training and, and, and trialling without it actually having to go onto a commercial site. Um, so, so having that kind of playpen or sand pit or, or some space where people can actually access it both for training and both for, uh, for trialling is absolutely something. And if there are areas that you think of the, that would make a great sand pit or playpen, love, love to hear what they are um, and we can start looking at that because that's what we're, we're really trying to do is to get, get, find those areas where we can accelerate the development into, into a commercial situation. Because there is that, there is a gap. There is a gap between the technology developer, and part of the, the reasons we don't collaborate is we actually don't know what's possible. We don't know who to collaborate with. I mean, I'll say this year that I've had in Nera, um, there are pockets of amazing facilities and expertise right across this country, um, and I suspect in my second year at Nera, I'll still keep discovering pockets in research institutes, in companies, in industry associations, in, in education facilities. Um, and and it, it's really just about showcasing and promoting what we currently have now so that we can build some of those links. But yeah, we do need more of those sort of spaces. Um, I, I wanted to comment on that as well. Um, if I understood the question correctly, and I'm not sure I did, um, you know, what I would say is that I agree, uh, but what I'd also say is, is that in the mining space, um, you know, Metz Ignited is a pretty good I mean, it, it per, does provide funding to companies who have a, you know, who, who have so, a, a product that's at the verge of being commercialized. So, so they do provide some of that sort of the support that, that you've identified and, 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 you know, and I agree can sometimes be important that just that last little push or proof of concept or something like that. Um, and, and actually it was, I was at, uh, you know, um, uh, another talk that, Sue Kay gave at the at the um, AGCC, and I, I didn't. I haven't been able to find this figure, but she said apparently that that a large, as an example, that a large proportion of the world's mining software gets written in Brisbane, which I never realized. Um, I knew that some of it did, but I didn't realize. So you know, there are that, that that's. I think that sort of thing is happening. It's not a, you know, it's obviously it could be better, but there, you know, there is a mechanism there, and and I guess in in defense of the Queensland government, I'd say that the. That, that Mets Ignited is, is here in Brisbane because of quite substantial support from the state government. So, yeah. Perhaps I'll uh, uh, add another dimension to that too. Only yesterday we were talking um, at the tenure level, particularly the minerals tenure level, uh, EPMs, um, how do we decide one application over another? And how do we judge applications for renewal and that sort of thing and progression to mining lease? And there's a number of criteria we're looking at, and one of them is people who are, can de demonstrably show they're doing something different and innovative. We should reward that and, and support that, if it's real. I mean, it shouldn't just be pie in the sky. Likewise, you know, are they a greater critical mass to actually move into production? So we move away from a fragmented resource. There's a number of criteria which, which we're working through internally, not ready for public release yet, around how we, I think, work towards the sort of thing that you've, you've described. So... Well, Tony, I would just say that most of the big discoveries are found by the small companies that then sell to the big companies. Yeah. And the big gap here is, is that you're encouraging big companies and the system is set to actually favour the big companies 
And the stock companies can't get a look at it. Now, you may say that they can, but sitting where I am, I'm telling you there's a damn high mountain. Mm. Now, I have, in another country, owned my own license. I wouldn't even think about doing it here, and it's getting harder. Mm. And so, if you want to get and encourage these big fights, you actually have to stimulate that grassroots, that collaboration with the, with the small companies that are in the community, that get that shareholder or community buy and they go for it. Stratified title might be one thing. Um, getting people who are comfortable. There's a whole range of things. But I think that where what I've been looking at is that where the policy is heading is actually to enshrine the big companies in these licenses and it's getting harder and harder to move them out. So they're collecting license, they're sitting on license, and they're not doing a hell of a lot of innovation. I'm telling you, they are not doing the innovation. I'm telling you they are, but when you go to them with the innovation, and it may be that it's well accepted offshore, show me where it's operating here. Even to the extent where the company office in Brisbane had a subsidiary using the technology offshore wouldn't pick the phone up to talk to that company. So they've got to be jolted and that is the position and the job that the government has, I think, is to get a bigger diversity and greater participation. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think if I just move out of the mineral space for a minute into petroleum, because we, we obviously work across the entire spectrum, I sit on the committee that decides the petroleum tenders. I, I chair that committee. So we decide who gets, you know, the, the Senex block and that sort of thing. And the, some of the criteria there are diversity and efficiency. In fact, they are the key criteria we look at. Diversity, which is what you're talking about. So being a big player is in the, of itself not enough. It's, does that talk to efficiency? Does it talk to diversity? Because we want new entrants into the market. So it's the same concept. So it's already happening, maybe not in minerals yet, but once again, the user to loser principle also applies and it'll be enforced more rigorously into the future, which is why we're talking about how do we decide who should get tenure or who should keep tenure. Sitting on tenure and land banking as it's referred to in government is definitely out of favour. Unless we can see people are legitimately building critical mass to support a project. It's not, not an easy thing. You've got to look at it carefully. But I do think that what you're describing, the government is totally aware of and trying to respond to. That's why we talk about collaboration. That's what the junior end probably needs to do. The big players look after themselves. But we need both ends of that spectrum working. I don't care who finds a big deposit, really. As a state geologist, I want someone to find it. If it's a junior, good luck to them, fantastic. The share price goes through the roof, great. They go and retire in Isle of Capri. Um, uh, but that, that's what we're trying to do as, as government. But it's, you know, you've got to change the wheel, the, the ship of government turns very slowly. But uh, we might, um, Matt, yeah, look, sorry. Mine was just a, a, a short comment about the, the skill needs going to the future you were talking about before. Um, I think in geology we've been really good at building silos of, of groups. You know, I'm, a, I'm an igneous petrologist or I'm a geochemist or I'm a, a structural geologist and I think the generational shift in, in geoscience is people are becoming more, you know, well, I'm a geophysicist but I'm across a whole bunch of different technologies, not just pure mathematical geophysics. And I, I think that's, that's a good thing as we move towards that. Um, and I think as we move to this new stage of, you know, AI and ML, we, we, we don't forget that and we don't have this um, new silo of machine learning or AI that is this, this separate entity or separate body that has its own problems, but we make sure that we, we, we start to merge our languages, we start to bring geology closer towards that ML space, and we start to bring the ML closer to understanding the geology. So I think that's where we need to be heading, and I think where we're heading in geoscience already, but we need to make sure as we move into new fields, and ML and, and AI is, is the, new, the next one, but there'll be more in the future, is we need to make sure that we're not building more silos, because we're good at that, but we're actually starting to integrate everything across that. 
Yeah, they're very good points. Thanks, mate. Well, I might wrap up now because um, um, it's getting late in the day and I'm sure people want to go. So, look, th thanks for your attendance. Um, I think it's been a successful Digging Deeper event. We will hold one next year. Um, I think they're, they're a great way to bring people together. They talk to collaboration and knowledge sharing, knowledge transfer. We like to do it as a GSQ to tell you what we've been up to, uh, and also what we're planning, what we're looking ahead towards into the future. And today, you would have seen that division. Um, a lot about the programs we've been working over the past year, but also you know, exposing you to some of the new ideas and thinking and concepts of what we see coming down the road. Artificial intelligence, a new resource classification system to, to ponder whether that fits uh, what we have here. Uh, robotics, you know, do they have a place for us in, in the exploration world? And I think if I go back to the example of drone technology, geophysics, that sort of thing, yes, I think, I think so. So really, uh, um, well, I think, I think the panellists, I know we, I, I, I coerced Rob at the last minute to come in, and also Rick, but also uh, Paul and, and Helen, uh, a valuable new asset into the, uh, the GSQ. And thanks to our other speakers from the GSQ. Um, I think the quality of presentations was good. Uh, the presentation was good, so I, I do thank you for your efforts. I know it's additional work than what you normally do, so I do appreciate your efforts. And thanks, everybody, for turning up. Thank you. <laughs>